Welcome to In the Word, a study of the International Bible School lesson. Join Dr. Lee Magnus, Professor Emeritus of Bible, and Dr. Bill Gwaltney, Professor Emeritus of Bible, both from Milligan College, as they bring you their thoughts and knowledge of the study of the Sunday School lesson for the day. Now, here is Dr. Magnus. Good morning and welcome to In the Word. We're uh, looking forward to this Lord's Day and uh, eager to be in worship uh, together and um, grateful that you could join us for our time of Bible study in the Word this morning. Dr. Roberts and I are together uh, again. Uh, we're looking forward to a time that Dr. Gwaltney can be back with us, but we're grateful that we're getting to work together uh, discussing these lessons. We're, we're closing out a, a quarter of study on covenant. And uh, this is the climactic lesson, and it's a good one, isn't it? Yeah, Dave? it is good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it brings us to something that we, uh, uh, that you and I, uh, and I'm sure most of our viewers agree, is central to our worship and to our identity as Christians, mm -hmm. and that is the Lord's Supper. Yes. And um, it's, it's a fitting conclusion to this quarter's study of, of covenant. Uh, we've seen this covenant theme traced all through the Old Testament and right up into the prophetic era where uh, the promise of a new covenant was given by Jeremiah. And now we're seeing that fulfilled and yes. brought to uh, fruition and completion in Jesus. Our title is Remembering the Covenant. Let's talk about that title just a second. Rem remembering, uh, memory is an important issue for us. And right. the, we take the loss of memory as a, as a terrible tragedy. It's an uh, illness when a person can't remember. Yeah, it yeah. is. And so we, we know with uh, you know, diseases of the mind that, that cause loss of memory, just how important remembering mm -hmm. can be. Mm -hmm. This, this remembering, though, uh, for us is a little more than just recalling an incident from the past, don't you think? Right. It's a, it's a connection again to our own identity and what makes us who we are. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where Paul's teaching to this church about the importance of what they were doing when they gathered around the table it's a connection to all that God has done before and all that God has done within us. Yeah. Um, when, when, the, when the Jews uh, remembered the Passover, they actually reenacted the mm -hmm. meal that they ate mm -hmm. right before the, the Exodus. Yeah. Right? And when they remembered um, well, at the Feast of uh, Booths or Tabernacles, they didn't just remember that their people had camped out in the Sinai Peninsula right. for 40 years. They actually went out in the backyard and built a little lean-to yes. and camped out in it. It's interesting, Robert Weber in recent times has written extensively about worship and, and talks about the drama involved in, in real worship uh -huh. and recounts those Hebrew experiences and the connections with their history and their awareness of God and then draws us to see that in, in Christian worship, there is a drama every mm -hmm. time we gather, especially as it focuses around the table. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about remembering the covenant in the context of the Lord's Supper, we're talking about more than just recalling uh, a past event. We're talking about uh, reclaiming Re repeating, reenacting, re something yeah. that's central to our faith mm -hmm. and to our uh, spiritual identity. Mm -hmm. Well, this passage um, uh, that we're studying today from 1 Corinthians is one of several uh, descriptions of the Last Supper of mm -hmm. Jesus. Uh, we find some in the Gospels as well, but this is a, a, a beautiful account. And it's interesting that, that Paul gave this because uh, th this account of the Last Supper and his teaching about the Lord's Supper, communion, because it comes out of a problem that, that, the, that the Corinthian Christians were having. Yes. And yeah, that, they had plenty of problems, didn't that they? That Corinthian church was a, 
a distinctive church. Just uh, Paul had established it. He loved it. There were people there that he was close to, but it was so full of problems. Yeah. It seems to have grown uh, fairly steadily, and it, it was a diverse congregation. It had people from all different mm -hmm. uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, different um, ethnic backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So, you know, from one angle, it, it seemed like it, it should have been a very healthy congregation. But, but one of the problems was that diversity mm -hmm. and the fact that it was division yeah. instead of diversity. Yeah. So, the, the, the letter of 1 Corinthians, from which our lesson is drawn this week, um, is a problem-solving kind of letter. It's not a yes. beautiful theological treatise like Romans or Ephesians. Um, it just take, takes up one congregational issue after another mm -hmm. and deals with it. And, and some of the issues are very, very serious. I mean, there's quarreling and divisiveness in the church. Mm -hmm. There's sexual immorality that's being practiced openly without censure in the congregation. They don't seem to understand marriage and human sexuality very well. Yeah. And on and on it goes. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. And one of the problems was in their commemoration of the Lord's Supper. And so Paul's uh, having to deal with that directly. And we're grateful that he dealt with it because he gives us some good insights right. into it. This chapter 11 begins talking about men and women and their roles and some of the social issues mm -hmm. and, and cultural issues and so forth. But then he comes on in verse 17 to talk about when you gather together, it's a problem. Yeah. You're not gathering with the right spirit. Yeah. And they're gathering for the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. But that supper, that communal meal was being abused in their attitudes toward one another and mm -hmm. their divisions and their separation to the point where it was exclusive and, yeah. and problematic. Yeah. Best we can tell, something like this was happening. Um, Christians met on the first day of the week. Now, from a Jewish perspective, first day of the week could be Saturday evening on over into Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, but since in, in, at that time, there was no such thing as a weekend. We, right. Weekends had not yeah. been invented. Yeah. And Sundays and Saturdays weren't days off for anybody. Mm -hmm. So um, shopkeepers would have had to have their shops open seven days a week. Mm -hmm. And you, you stay open until nightfall, till the crowds uh, stop coming. They, they were limited in what time, when they could come to worship. Mm -hmm. Slaves are totally at the mercy right. of their master's whims mm -hmm. uh, when they could get free for worship. So it, it, it's not like we say, okay, we're gonna all gather for worship at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. You know, you could, yeah. they could have tried that, but there, there's no way everybody could have showed up at the last minute. Mm -hmm. So in that culture, they have to kind of wait, mm -hmm. wait for one another to come. Yeah. Of course, wealthy people can come and go as they please. They, they can come. And, and they would have brought the bulk of the food, too. Mm -hmm. this, this seems, this, communion seems to have been in the context of a meal. It was a full meal, apparently. Yeah. But as part of it, they took time to remember uh -huh. and to recognize who they were and why they were. Yeah. So the sociological context seems to be that wealthy people can come around the time that was set for worship and they bring the food and they're sitting around chatting with one another while they're happily waiting mm -hmm. for the rest of the congregation to arrive, maybe snacking a little bit uh, <laughs> the way you, you do at a potluck or something like that. And then maybe the shopkeepers uh, come in um, and eventually the slaves. And mm -hmm. as a result, what was supposed to bring them together in corporate worship, they weren't doing it together. Well, Paul says in that chapter that some people were eating, gorging themselves to the point of being drunk mm -hmm. and others were going hungry. Yeah. So that seems to be the, the concrete sociological problem. So it, it comes out to, to, to be a problem related to class mm -hmm. and to social rank and mm -hmm. to economic mm -hmm. uh, matters as well. It's an, it's an interesting challenge. So we need to think about the ways in which what we expect of one another as Christians, what impact does that have on people of 
different social classes mm -hmm. or different economic abilities. Right. You know? A, a sensitivity to, to one another yeah. in different yeah. situations is important. Yeah. And, and in that context, Paul is really appalled at what they're doing and how they're doing it and how they're calling this the Lord's Supper and it isn't the yeah. way they're acting and, and how they're ignoring the needs of one another. Yeah. And so he's drawing them back to what it's really about, Good. remembering the covenant. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. Well, I think that's enough background. Let's, uh, why don't you go ahead and read the text and then we'll okay. discuss it. In 1 Corinthians 11, beginning at verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And then Paul added, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they, before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further directions. Very good. Well, the passage starts out um, using the language of tradition, passing along a tradition, of mm -hmm. an important tradition. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Mm -hmm. And here's this uh, very important concept that was, was crucial in the life of the early church of passing on our understanding of, of Jesus, mm -hmm. his life, his ministry, his death and resurrection, and the implications of that from generation to generation. Right. It was an oral tradition, mm -hmm. but it was a generational teaching yeah. that was Yeah. Essential. And um, we probably should take that seriously still today mm -hmm. and maybe more seriously mm -hmm. than we do um, to, to explain, you know, I, I think we've had the experience of worshiping in congregations where communion just happens right. with no explanation, right. haven't you? And, and visitors that? sometimes would wonder, what are they doing? Why are they doing this? Yeah, we, we obviously know what's happening and why. Mm -hmm. But any, any new seeker uh, in our congregation or a visitor. Or, or children. Or, or yeah, ch a child who's transitioned from some youth worship maybe up into mm -hmm. adult worship. Um, and it, of course, remembering, we've already said, is so important. It, it doesn't hurt any of us, I think, to be reminded why we mm -hmm. are doing what we're doing in mm -hmm. communion. Exactly. And here Paul doesn't hesitate to say, look, I, I received this tradition and I passed it on to you and now let me remind you. Mm -hmm. um, one of our teachers at Milligan and a longtime president there, Dean Walker, uh, believed that these words should be recited or read every time we gather for worship. The words of institution. Yeah, every time, just so we all were constantly reminded why we're going through these mm -hmm. motions mm -hmm. so we didn't just go through the motions. Right. Uh, we had to remember it. And I think there's something to that. Definitely. Well. Um, and I think there's, a, there's an importance in, 
in the taking of the bread and the cup, mm -hmm. which are physical substances mm -hmm. we partake, that helps us recognize our faith, our relationship with, with God in Christ is not just an abstract mental or spiritual mm -hmm. thing. It's a whole body, yeah. a whole life experience. It's body and soul. Mm -hmm. And the physical act of Jesus' death on the cross is remembered mm -hmm. in physical act of taking bread and cup. Yeah. We believe the same thing about baptism, don't mm -hmm. we? Mm -hmm. the, 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 actually, the physical drama, the physical mm -hmm. act is important in nailing down the reality, the spiritual reality. Yeah. The that, very fact of the incarnation, that, yeah. that God did not just come in spirit, but he mm -hmm. came in flesh. Yeah, that's, that's good. Well, uh, Jesus took this bread, which would have been the unleavened bread that they used at the Passover. Passover. Yeah. And uh, it says he gave thanks to God. That might help people understand what the other accounts of this meal in the Gospels mean when they say he took bread and blessed and broke. Mm -hmm. I think uh, this says he gave thanks and broke. So the blessing there is the blessing of God that is the praising of God or here give thanks. Mm -hmm. And that word thanks in Greek is Eucharist. Yes. Yeah. Eucharist. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, we know some of our fellow Christians who use the term Eucharist for the, the mm -hmm. Lord's Supper. I, I grew up thinking that was just a Catholic term. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just, yeah. Catholics made that up. Well, they didn't. It's a, it's a perfectly good biblical term mm -hmm. uh, for the Last Supper because it highlights the fact that we're giving thanks to God for the saving death of Jesus. Mm -hmm. These different terms or, or titles we use mm -hmm. for the, the act, the Lord's Supper, Communion, Eucharist, mm -hmm. they're all significant and, and each has a, a contribution to make to our understanding. The word communion mm -hmm. indicates it's something we're doing together as community. Mm -hmm. And it's important to recognize, especially in what Paul's saying here in 1 Corinthians, that this was not just an isolated individual, personal, one-on-one -on -one with God time. Mm -hmm. It was a sharing time mm -hmm. as the body of Christ. Yeah. And that's, that's part of what's mm -hmm. really discussed and, here. And the phrase Lord's Supper or Lord's Table is also important because it reminds us that Jesus is the host, mm -hmm. it's his meal. Mm -hmm. And that it is a meal, I mean, right. it, it's a, it's a, which, which has a certain sociological significance. Yeah. Well, uh, he says, this, this bread is my body. Um, he's talking about his physical body, which is for you. In other mm -hmm. words, it's given for you. And then do this in remembrance of me. Well, that's an important statement to it. We've seen it carved on communion tables mm -hmm. and, and everything. I used to stare at it at the, on the communion table as I was growing up. Um, the one, th one thing I've learned about that is that there, there are three ways of saying my in Greek. Hmm. A kind of mild way, a stronger way, and a super strong way. Hmm. And this is the strongest way hmm. of saying my. Hmm. So do this in my remembrance. Of it's me. really stressed. Of me, yeah. Mm -hmm. Really stressed. Um, similarly, after supper, the cup. Uh, there were four cups used during the Passover commemoration, mm -hmm. and this seems to be the last, the last one there. Um, and again, in remembrance of me. Now, I, I like the way you read, when we get to verse 26, you said, and Paul adds, because the quotation from Jesus is verse 24 through verse 25, right? Mm -hmm. The quote marks come there and there. And this is Paul's added explanation. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I find that significant. Whenever you eat and drink, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's, that's a powerful statement, it isn't is. it? It is. It draws in past, present, future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Jesus died. His, Jesus' death stands in the past. It's, it's history. Uh, but every time we eat, we don't even have to open our mouths. Well, I guess we do open our mouths, <laughs> but we, we don't even have to speak. We, we proclaim through our actions right. in the present 
our faith in the saving death of Jesus. And then until he comes, leans into the future of mm -hmm. anticipation. Mm -hmm. Good. All right, now the, the, the really tough phrases come in the next few verses. Um, these are a little harder to interpret. So whenever you eat the bread or drink the cup, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner. And that has led to confusion, hasn't it? It has, but Paul had to be thinking about the attitudes of the people toward one another mm -hmm. and the divisions of the congregation there. And, and when you think of the congregation as the body of Christ, and he's talking here about discerning the body of Christ, mm -hmm you have to recognize he's looking both at the bread and Jesus' body on the cross, but he's also looking at the congregation, Jesus' body in, mm -hmm. in people. Yeah. So that, that's, that sociocultural context that we were talking about earlier comes into play here. Paul says this, the, the way in which, the manner in which mm -hmm. you are doing communion mm -hmm. where you know, the rich people come and chat it up and eat for a while, and then the poor people come and they don't really intermix and they don't mm -hmm. experience this together. That is an unworthy way to treat the corporate right. body of Christ. Yeah. And if you're treating the corporate body of Christ in an unworthy way, you're treating the body of Christ who died mm -hmm. for you in an unworthy way. It's interesting. I, I grew up, as many of us did, taking communion when it was passed and it was a private thing and you spent time in mm -hmm. personal meditation, quietness and so forth, oblivious to anyone else around. Mm -hmm. And then I go to a, a church now where we move to the front to, to partake communion and it's all this activity and motion and people mm -hmm. moving about and commotion. But it's made me more aware of the congregation and realizing we're taking this together. We're the mm -hmm. body of Christ mm -hmm. sharing communally yeah. in the communion. Yeah. And, you know, the way I was raised, like you, uh, that commotion or that awareness. I mean, I remember being taught, shut everybody else out. Yeah. Don't, you know, so I, I would thought, okay, I can't even think of my parents sitting beside me or my brother or, or whatever. Uh, and... And really, it's just the opposite. That, right. That's the unworthy manner. Right. If, if I focus it just on myself, mm -hmm. uh, the worthy manner would be to remember that Jesus not only died for me, but for all of us mm -hmm. as we come together for worship. But it's important, too, to, to see that the, the NIV brings us out as a, an unworthy manner, mm -hmm. where the King James has an unworthily, yeah. which is an adverb. Yeah. But I, I can remember people over the years saying, oh, I, I never take communion because I'm unworthy yeah. and I can't take it. And Paul wasn't saying... That misses the point yes, completely of what Paul's talking about it, here. It's really because we're unworthy that we come to the table yeah. and partake because we need the Savior. Yeah. We're here to yeah. recognize that's what it's yeah, about. Yeah, I think you and I agree that we would urge people never to absent themselves from the Lord's table because of an overwhelming sense of personal sin in their lives. An overwhelming sense of personal sin in your life is the very reason why we come to the table. Exactly. That, that's why we come. That's not why we avoid it. Yeah. And uh, when Paul's talking about worthiness here, he's not talking about personal worthiness. He's talking about the way in which we do things. Mm -hmm. Well, you've already done a good job of explaining verse 29 without uh, without discerning the body, uh, the NIV adds, of Christ. Because that word body is is beautifully ambiguous it here, is. isn't it? Yes. As, as you have just explained, um, it refers both to the, the body of Christ dying on the cross, but also the church, the body of Christ for whom he died. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we need to keep both those things in mind. Mm -hmm. Now, in the middle of that, verse 28, this idea of examining yourself is yes. talked about there. Yes. So uh, it is true that, that some self-examination is important, oh, yes. I think, in communion, isn't it? Definitely. And, and, and the more we mm -hmm. do that, the more we appreciate why we're here. Yeah, right. 
So coming to the Lord's table with a sense of repentance in self-examination is fine. There, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that that's not all that's going on right. in that yeah. as well. Uh, Paul makes quite a statement here in verse 30. He says, this divisive way, this self-centered way in which you're doing communion uh, has left many of you weak and sick. And he may mean physically, and he may mean spiritually, mm -hmm. and sometimes spiritual weakness and sickness brings about uh, physical, physical problems. Right. And yes. uh, fallen asleep, of course, is a euphemism for died. Right. So he said this can have disastrous consequences. And it, it could be physical death. It could be falling asleep spiritually to mm -hmm. the point where you died spiritually. Yeah. But. We, we probably should skip ahead to the last few verses where we can wrap this up. So then, that means he's coming to a conclusion, whenever you gather to eat, and here's his real teaching, you should all eat together. Mm -hmm. Wait for one another. Mm -hmm. And here we see that of all the theological issues that, that surround the Lord's Supper, the issue that Paul is most interested in here in this situation is the communal nature of communion. Yes. As you pointed out, yeah. that's the word. Yeah. Uh, and he said, this isn't just about satisfying hunger. Right, and, and his, his statement there in, in verse 34, anyone who's hungry should eat something at home. Mm -hmm. uh, I've known people in the past who said, well, you shouldn't have a church kitchen. You shouldn't have meals in the church mm. because you should eat at home. Mm. Well, Paul wasn't saying it's wrong to eat at the church, yeah. he's saying if all you're doing is coming for physical food, then yeah, just do that at home. Yeah. But eating together, it's how we share the important things with our families, with the people we love. We sit down and, and share a meal together. So potlucks are okay. You're right. Telling, oh, good. Okay. <laughs> I was worried there that yeah. you were. Uh, that's good. Well, um, this has been a wonderful lesson to wrap up this whole quarter, because the word covenant literally means come together, a coming together. And the, the Lord's Supper is the, the point at which the body of Christ comes together every time we gather for worship mm -hmm. to uh, remember God's saving work in Christ. And so wh what, a, what a beautiful time and place for celebrating the covenant, for remembering the covenant mm -hmm. when we come together in Christian worship at the table of the Lord. And as we've seen this track all the way through the Old and New Testament, it's all been pointing toward Jesus mm -hmm. and uh, what he has done to accomplish God's will. And we talked to you earlier, uh, the, the times we've been in a strange situation, a congregation we're not familiar with, mm -hmm. and music may be different, people we don't know, but when you come around the table, it points us back to Jesus mm -hmm. and draws us together with Christians mm -hmm. all around the world. Yeah, so that's the, the point at which we're always at home in the family of God, mm -hmm. uh, celebrating in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, what a great way. Uh, we have wrapped up our quarter here uh, in this beautiful passage from 1 Corinthians about the covenant. Uh, we hope that you have an opportunity to celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper today and remember the covenant and in the weeks, uh, months, and years ahead that you'll remember this passage and it will add meaning and significance to your celebration of the Lord's Supper and, and to your lives. We hope to see you next week as we begin a new quarter. This has been In the Word. A study of the International Bible School lesson with Dr. Lee Maggs, Professor Emeritus of Bible from Milligan College, and Dr. Bill Gwaltney, Professor Emeritus of Bible of Milligan College. Join us again next week for another lesson from the International Bible School lesson text. This has been a production of the First Christian Church Television Ministries.